My talk is going to be super packed about a, like a topic that I think um, it is relevant um, in today's news. And um, I'll try to go as fast as possible through all of this stuff. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be interesting for you. And um, I really, really hope I'm not going to be that late. So I'm really sorry for the organizers about that. So let's go. Um, <clears throat> you might have, um, you might have, you might know that um, this Monday there was like um, an interesting, um, interesting day. It was Guy Fox Night, and um, what makes this um, Guy Fox Night uh, event uh, really interesting is that they tried to blow up the parliament. There was, it was a, there was a gang of guys, and uh, the most famous one was Guy Fox, and um, is the third, is the one the third to the right. And basically, he, he, they tried to blow up the parliament. And what's not so known about this guy is that he, almost has, um, he, almost, uh, he also said a famous quote. And um, he said that, who owns the information owns the world. And we're going to get back to this one a little bit later. So, my name is Dan Dimitar. I graduated from Imperial College almost four years ago. Since then, I'm a security researcher at Kaspersky Lab, and you might know as the guy who developed um, the open source distributed uh, Yara scanner, Clara, which my company, Kaspersky Lab, we open sourced it this year. So that's a little bit about myself, a little bit about, about my team. Um, we are called Global Research and Analysis Team, and basically we are focused on highly advanced attacks. We have been founded like almost 10 years ago. This year we celebrated uh, our 10th anniversary. And since then, we are tasked with finding and fighting against advanced attacks um, for, again, like for advanced, like finding advanced attacks against banks, um, governments, power plants, and everything that is like um, <coughs> critical infrastructure and so on. But, you know, um, I would like to start asking a question. Like, if, if we Google search war, and we search for images of war on Google, you might actually find out this kind of stuff, or this stuff. You might find, like, which is, looks pretty normal, you know. It, it seems uh, pretty normal for, like, war images. And this is what we, we know, and this is what we expect to find when we're searching for war uh, on Google. What about if we're searching for the info war? So you might have heard a bit about info war, but Google definitely didn't hear about Infowar, or at least this is, the, this is Google's definition of Infowar. And it's kind of like a silly, silly stuff, like for example, this um, grenade with uh, some uh, keyboard keys, and there's like this plane dropping some cursor, I don't know, like my, um, some cursors here, like, you know, it's not that relevant, and it actually doesn't make sense, you know, for, for all of us. But then actually, instead, Infowar might look like this. So it might happen around us, it might happen right now, and it's all around us, it could possibly be all around us, it can be like, it m actually, it might be happening at the dev camp right now, and people don't realize it, it's like really close to us. And I think this is very important because Infowar, it's not something that people are actually um, taking care of or like um, caring that much about this one. So, okay, you might ask yourself, fine, if the Infowar is here, what's next? Well, we defined, uh, we defined Infowar um, within Kaspersky Lab uh, having three components, uh, and those three components are the cyber espionage, cyber sabotage, and mass opinion manipulation, where two components are using malware, the cyber espionage and sabotage, whereas the, those two components are using malware, the third one uh, is actually mass opinion manipulation, and we are pretty good in those two uh, items. But on the third one, actually, we're not so good. We're not doing so good. So I said, OK, fine. Uh, I would like to research this topic, and I'd like, to, I'd like to present you my findings. But before we do that, before we go to the present, we have to go a little bit in the past. We have to understand why and way, um, when, why, and um, how some of the things happen. So I'm not going to go like super in depth, like um, from the uh, ancient Rome or like from the ancient um, <coughs> ancient um, uh, 
Syria or whatever, but instead we're going to go a little bit and we're going to focus on the Cold War period. And I would like to ask if you know who this guy is, and I'm not talking about the dead guy on the left, I'm talking about the, the guy in the middle. Anybody knows who this guy is? Okay, what about this one? Like he's the same guy? Cool. So, you want me to Pachepa, and I think it wasn't, there wasn't any better introduction to my presentation here in Bucharest rather than talking about Ioan Mihai Pacepa, which is, was one of the um, Romanian spies who defected to America, and uh, he's still alive, and basically he wrote a lot of information about, um, uh, he wrote some books about uh, disinformation and um, his other book is called The Red Horizons. So, if you haven't read his books, I actually recommend you reading those ones. I didn't read um, Red Horizons yet, so um, I would like to read it as well. I just skimmed it a bit. But he basically said something, and he, he scratched the surface of what uh, we nowadays call desinformatia. So, desinformatia, um, by defined by this um, fine gentleman here, who was the, the director of Department X. Department X of the Department of Disinformation from the East German um, Foreign Intelligence. So this guy said that our friends in Moscow, they call it um, disinformatia. The Americans are calling it active measures. And it's my favorite activity. So Eastern Germans were like very good at dis disinformation. And we, we know it at all. But Chepa also said in his book that if you're good at with disinformation, you're good with anything. You can get away with anything. And I think, I think this, this is actually pretty, pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> in his book, he also says that um, Stalin himself coined this term of disinformation, which is actually itself a disinformation. And this is why, because um, he says that Stalin wanted to give it uh, like um, a more Latin root, disinformatia, disinformation, which basically comes from uh, French, instead of giving it, um, giving it a Slavic root. So the term itself, it's actually called disinform it's actually disinforming the term itself. Well, honestly, I'm not so sold on this theory, mostly because Pacepa in his Red Horizons book, he kind of like um, didn't right, like a lot, all of things were true. For example, he said that uh, Ceausescu um, was, every day Ceausescu was using a new suit, um, suit, and then at the end of the day he was burning that uh, suit. Well, um, historic uh, sources tell us that it, that wasn't true. So, um, you know, I would, I would take with a grain of salt what Pacepa said in his book. And of course, like, um, put, put yourself in his shoes, like he went to the Americans. He, he, like he should, he must have written something bad about, uh, about the Russians. Okay, so I would like to ask you some, uh, uh, um, some questions and you'll have to tell me which of them you think uh, are true. So first of all, is like AIDS was created in a lab, the earth is flat, Napoleon was like short, we eat banana clones and Einstein failed at maths. Who believes that all of, this, all of these statements are true? Okay, who believes that four of the statements are true? What about three? What about oh, three? We have like some. Okay. What about two? We have some more. One statement is true. Okay. We have some other. No, none of the statements are true. Okay. So I'm sorry to disappoint. Only one statement is true, and the, this one is that we eat banana. We eat the cloned bananas. So actually, it's a funny trivia. Is that if there was a new bacteria, new new um, fungus that would uh, affect the actual the actual strain of bananas. Right now, all of all of our banana population um, population would be dead. So um, be careful with bananas. Well. Why did you consider that the other statements were also true? Well, first of all, um, there was this myth of Napoleon was short. Well, actually, when he, his height was uh, measured, it was measured in five feet two inches, which is indeed short, but it was French, French feet. It wasn't British feet. Actually, he was 1.7. So there's like this slight difference between British feet and French feet. And he was like 1.7. He was like quite tall, I would, I would say so. Einstein failed at maths. Also, this, um, this was debunked by Einstein himself when they asked him, like, hey, you know, did you fail at math? Because, like, people are saying that. And he was like, no, what the heck? Like, I knew um, I was, like, pretty good when I was, like, 15 years old. And I was, like, 
I mastered different uh, differential and integral calculus back then. And this makes sense, no? Because he was like a genius. He was a ingeni genius in physics. And it doesn't make sense that he failed maths, because maths, you need maths for physics. So all of this kind of stuff are the core components of active um, niemere. <coughs> and if you don't know Russian, this means active, uh, active measures. And let's, say, let's see what active measures actually mean. And we see here from, uh, from the Wikipedia source, active measures is a Soviet term for the actions of political warfare, actually collecting intelligence and producing politically correct assessments. And also active measures range from media manipulations to special actions involving various degrees of violence. So basically, this is, this is one of the definitions. Um, if, you, if we look in a, in a research that was published last year by the London School of Economics, they also define the fact that active measures can include a combination of um, white, gray, and black propaganda. And then um, you, might ask, you might ask me, like, hey, Dan, you know, what's this like white, gray, and black propaganda? Well, white propaganda is it's information that comes from known known sources. So, um, for example, we might have like a news outlet that is spreading propaganda, or we might have like leaflets that are being dropped on the battlefield. This is like white propaganda. Gray pro black propaganda comes, comes from unknown sources. And this is more interesting, you know, because, for example, you might have like, um, um, for example, uh, radio stations that are supporting the anti-Soviet movement. But actually, those radio stations are spreading propaganda, are spreading propaganda against, against Soviets. But actually, those, uh, those stations are controlled by, by Moscow, are controlled by the Russians. And basically, what they do, they try to subvert, they try to delay the people, they try to um, um, force them to um, not, have, not be so organized. So basically, it's a way to dismantle groups. It's a way to block people um, to achieve their goal. And of course, gray prop propaganda, it's, like, um, it's more interesting because you know, you know the source, but you, you're not sh you, know, you don't know for a fact that it's working for a government or a state directly. So for example, when the Korean War happened, uh, Russians, um, Russians started this um, these talks or conferences about world peace. And those conferences were actually looking good at the beginning, and they attracted a lot of attention. They attracted the attention of like uh, high, um, high profile persons like Pablo Picasso, for example, he joined this, this movement. But little did they know that actually uh, the, main, the main purpose of those um, um, conferences was to actually put the blame on the Americans, to make them look bad. So basically, you present a good cause, but actually your, your um, motive is, is um, bad intention. So, let's see the cookbook of uh, active measures. And again, in their, um, in their research, we see that you have like front organizations, agents of influence, infiltrating media, use fake stories and use forgeries in order to um, promote your um, hidden agenda and in order to be able to make people act or believe as you want. So this is pretty good, this is pretty good. And then like, let's have some examples. And I mentioned before AIDS, and then um, this, this is actually a, a controversy even now that AIDS was human made. And I spoke with uh, a lot of medics and all of them told me that it's current, currently like they don't believe that it's possible to produce aid, it AIDS in a, in a lab, but rather it was a mutation. It was like um, the, um, uh, another mutation that we actually, we, we've seen in our country as well. So it's, that was kind of a mutation. And um, there was this document, a uh, secret document that was, um, that was released. And basically this operation was called, um, the Americans are saying that this operation was called the infection operation. And basically you can check, um, we can check this report by this, this guy Thomas. And basically they're saying, when does this campaign start? When did this campaign start? And we have, we have it here. On the 17th of July, 1983, there was, a, there was a paper published in Pakistan saying, AIDS may uh, invade India, mystery disease caused by U.S. experiments. They also continue and say, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you can see it uh, well. Uh, they say, 
um, AIDS is believed to be a result of the Pentagon experiments. And that was it. Then, from that paper from Pakistan, it was then um, referenced by other news media in the world, and this information spread along. What's also interesting is that by the 1980s, this new, um, this new syndrome, the AIDS syndrome, was not well known. It didn't even have a name. It had a name two years later. And the Americans didn't actually know how to handle that one. It was pretty, pretty new for, for them at that time. And the Soviets actually f um, managed to find this moment and to take advantage of this moment. So this is pretty OK. Nobody died from this fake news. But then you might actually have fake uh, fatal consequences. So this is another, um, this is, uh, this are, this are, this is another example. Um, and basically, in 1968, there was a paper that was a paper that was called "Who's Who in the CIA," and it, this paper was distributed in the East German. And basically, what the, uh, this paper said, in a nutshell, this is a list of CIA, CIA agents, and half of them, half of the names were were real, half of the names were fake. Well, what happened two years later? A guy whose name was identical, similar to the a list of the fake names that appeared in that list was killed, mostly because his name appeared in that fake list. So bam, basically, he, there was a terrorist who killed him. Furthermore, there's another example of an event that happened at Mecca. Basically, there was an explosion, and um, a lot of people were like killed. And basically, the, the Soviets said, OK, hmm, this sounds like a good idea. Let's spread a rumor, a rumor, they spread a rumor saying that this plot was, um, this explosion was plotted by the Americans and Israelis. What happened next? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't think you can see it. The rumor sparked an attack by the Soviet Union. The US embassy was attacked. Amer one American was kidnapped. Two Pakistani employees died. A Marine Corps was shot. And an American contractor has been left to burn to death from a rumor. That, that was it. That, like, you went to somebody and say, okay, that's a rumor, and that, that's it. And then, like, all these people died. Cool. So, of course, in order to deploy these techniques, you need a lot of money. So, how much money, actually? Well, again, the, um, the publicly released, released paper, um, the one about AIDS, also says that, oh, sorry, also says that in 1980s, a conservative CIA estimates puts the annual cost of Soviet active measures at $3 billion back in the 1980s per year, which is actually $9 billion in our money right now due to inflation every year. So this is how much the Russians were actually spending in order to promote their agenda and to use these active measures. That's pretty impressive. But, you know, they were not the only ones, you know. They were the more pre most preeminent, but not the only ones. The Americans were actually doing the same. So this is like a stamp from the, from the Second World War propaganda, where they were depicting Hitler as like um, this uh, monster, and um, like you should fight with your life um, the Nazi, the Nazi um, threat. And basically, this is, um, this is the American way of doing uh, active measures. This is like um, an airborne leaflet propaganda. So basically, it's a bomb. You load it up with propaganda, and you drop it. So it doesn't do any damage, but it just spreads a lot of leaflet. So this is, uh, this is actually um, proto like this was, this was used by the Americans. But I think you might actually know a, a better example of um, active measures used by the Americans. And I see a lot of people who are, like I think, old enough to have heard of Radio Free Europe. And we can see that from... Um, and again, from, from a CIA document that was like, um, <clears throat> released to the public, they, s they say here that um, this radio was actually pretty, um, pretty annoying, uh, the people, people like uh, the authorities from the Eastern Bloc. So because of that, they used 1,500 jam jamming stations in order to try to block it. Was it successful? No, because actually this radio was still broadcasting. But it's actually an interesting, uh, another interesting fact is that <coughs> in, this, in this document that was sent from the um, American attaché at the Western Embassy to the uh, uh, secret Deputy Secretary of State, and you can see the link here, he basically says that 
It is regrettable that Radio Free Europe is still entirely financed by the USA and that we, uh, the Europeans have failed to show financial interest. So basically he's saying, we're pulling all the money and nobody else is putting, the, uh, giving, uh, putting their money into this uh, project, which is okay, pretty, uh, which was pretty okay. But later he also says that, you know, Apart from the fact that the German government grants the license for the European Broadcasting Station, there is no reason why Radio Free Europe should fail, uh, fall under German control. So basically, in other words, he's saying that, you know, we want people to give us money, to put money into this project, but we don't want to give out um, control over it. We want to control it ourselves, but it would be better if other, peop other states would actually put their money uh, into, in, the bas in, the, in the basket as well. If you want to read more about um, the CIA operation and the Radio Free Europe, this is the book you, you, want, you should read, and it's pretty interesting. Okay, so we talked about Russia, we talked about America. I'm really sorry, like, I, I, there was like, there's a lot tons of other states that we can talk about, but I think um, I shouldn't miss the opportunity of talking about Romania. So, in, you know, in Romania, I wasn't born in the communist period, so um, I've heard, so I've read also in the news, that there were like food rations. So people were actually kind of starving, it, it, it was a kind of a hard period, and uh, you had rations. You had like a um, limited amount of food that you, can get, you could get every month. So a food ration looks like this. Basically, it tells your name, it tells like, well, how many family members you have, and how much food did you buy every month. The interesting fact is that people were actually trusting uh, sci the scientific um, community. So everything that was like science, everything that was like um, researchers, they were trusted. So basically, um, the Romanian government asked some scientists to write this report saying that it's healthy for a um, grown-up man to only eat one kilogram of chicken every month. And this was actually convenient because it was actually the amount of, uh, of chicken that they received during uh, ev every month. So basically, they used scientific facts, which, of course, like you, you could e eat a lot more chicken than one kilogram. Um, they used the scientific community to produce some facts that people actually believed in order to justify their own actions, their own, their own government actions. So, you know, this was in the past. So in the present, it's a bit different, but not so much. So let's look at um, this guy, Noah Tavlin. He has like an interesting um, YouTube video. And he basically um, discusses the idea that currently, in the present, we have access to a lot of information. And this is good and bad at the same time. We have access to um, like tons of applications. We have instant uh, um, notifications on, 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 on our mobile phones. We receive our uh, parking ticket instantly. We can download everything almost instantly. We want everything that really fast, 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 immediately. I want, it, uh, I want to get something, I, I, want to, um, I should get it right now. And he also said that because of that, our desire for quick answers may overpower the, des the desire to be certain of their validity. In other words, if you're looking for something and it's right there at, an, at arm's length and you get the result as fast as possible, then you might not be tempted to, um, you might not be tempted to actually fact check that thing. You might not be willing to go um, over the process of checking if that fact is true or not to see if actually that makes sense or, uh, or it doesn't make sense. And this is what fake news is uh, all about people not fact-checking their uh, other sources. Of course, there are more other subtle types of fake news, like, remember, gray, prop gray propaganda. He also presents in his video, which is like a three-minute video, so please, do, uh, please watch it, it's, uh, it's amazing, circular reporting. Circular reporting, you might have heard about it, basically says that you have a publication A, B, C, D, and E. Publication A, a does like an original content, publishes something, and then B, um, B references A, C, B, and then D and C, and so on. Well, this is all okay. Well, it's not okay in, in, from my point of view, but this is all okay, except when publication A publishes something that is fake. If this publication A publishes uh, fake news, then the entire chain will actually um, publish and reference fake news. And the problem is that if this chain is long enough, 
the actual news might become true. And this is, the, this is the problem, this is another problem, because people nowadays, they actually tend to act um, predictably, if I can say so. So, for example, what are the three main reasons why fake news are actually happening? Well, first of all, because of tribalism or partisanship. And this is when, um, ha this is what happens when you have a view and somebody else comes with, um, somebody else with the same view as yours comes along. And you're more willing to accept his, um, um, his um, answers, you're more willing to accept his proposals if that person, if that person um, is similar to you. And you're more willing to reject or to not be um, involved in a debate with a person that has different views that you have. And this is very important. Basically, it's like I call it the laziness of people. You have to have debate with people with different views than you have. Else, you're going to be in a bubble. And we're actually, there's like a lot of talks about these bubbles nowadays. Confirmation bias. If you are, if you are um, sure or you are, um, <coughs> You know, if, uh, like if you're sure of something and somebody else comes and reinforces that, uh, uh, confirms that thing, you're more, you're more actually, more likely to um, have your own confirmation reinforced. So basically, this means that you're not willing to talk to other people that have different views. You're actually going to be um, accepting uh, people. You're going to make friends with people with the same views that you have. And of course, the dangers of debunked ideas is another issue. An idea of fake news that stays long enough, it might become true. So we have this, uh, we have this example with the, we have this example with the uh, vaccines. There was one paper, 1998, that said vaccines cause autism. It wasn't debunked at that specific moment, so it stayed on and on. It caught on, and now we have this entire anti-vaccine movement, and you know the rest. So just from that paper, which was later proven to be false, so that paper is like totally bollocks, but it doesn't matter. It's true because a lot of time passed. So, you know, <coughs> Another approach of active measures, and I, I find it really interesting to look at the, um, at the Eurobarometer survey. And this survey says that most of the citizens are happy with their country being part of the EU. And then, if you look at the uh, percentage of um, how many citizens are unhappy with their country being part of the EU, we can see like uh, UK, which is the first 22% of people in UK are not happy about um, uh, being part of the EU. And the second country is Romania, actually. It is 21%. The third country is Greece. So, you know, this is quite shocking, but then, this barometer says that the, um, the threat of fake news and disinformation in Latvia, Sweden, and Romania are highest. So I think those two factors are actually correlated with each other. Also, a study that was um, developed by and was paid by Soros Foundation. Yay! So basically, they said that me uh, media literacy, literacy rankings are in the Balkans are very low. And they said that the, Balk the Balkans are most susceptible for fake news. And if, if we look at the rankings, we can see like Romania, Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro, Albania, Turkey, Macedonia, all of them are like super, super low. And I think this is the correlation between the fact that, um, in Romania at least, a lot of fake news have gained traction, and the fact that uh, we've seen movements of raw exit, Romania exit, like um, also Greece exit and Brexit. But the problem is that in Romania, the um, threat of fake news is um, more, is like more real than ever. And how do we do, like how do we combat this, uh, these facts? Well, there's like this uh, night, um, night science journalism program at MIT, and basically they said, we conducted an overall, um, one overall survey of multiple publications asking them, do you fact check your, uh, your publications or not. And basically, they, they found out that a lot of them, they don't have, uh, they don't have a quality control public uh, person. And furthermore, only one third of them actually had fact-checkers and researchers to do the fact-checking before publishing. 
Other publications, all of them had like editors who, who were in charge of doing that, and 50% copy editors for the people who are actually doing fact checks. Furthermore, they were paid like $13, $15, $19, and the average was $13 per hour. This is really important because, you know, um, fact checking nowadays is the most important part of journalistic investigation. And not only investigation, or journal journalistic process. And if you don't have capable people doing fact checks, then you're doing something wrong. So, lastly, um, if we add in this mix uh, about active measures, fake news, if we add the bots, and nowadays, um, current principles, we have like, we're gonna get like a pretty good uh, image. And you might have heard about the Troll Factory, it was all about in the news, like two weeks ago, Twitter published all their tweets from this Troll Factory. Read, read all the article, it's pretty interesting. This, uh, this lady here, Kate Starbird, basically he, she said in her research that there are paid trolls sitting side by side somewhere in St. Petersburg, because that troll factory is in St. Petersburg, hate walk quoting each other. So basically there's this guy who infiltrated both opposition groups that were like, um, this, is like it, this could be like um, Democrats uh, and um, um, like other groups, or like, it doesn't matter. You basically, the idea is, you have two groups of people who are clashing and debating uh, with each other. You infiltrate people in both groups, and then you start promoting your agenda. Why? Because of tribalism and confirmation bias, people in this group, they see that you are actually doing the same stuff there. Uh, they, have, they have the same views, and they're going to actually um, trust you. Same happens with the people in this group. But you're the same person in both groups. And then what happens? You might actually have accounts that are like, have like huge amounts of followers, like 100,000, you, you can't see it here, but it's like 100,000 followers who are actually being proven to be part of the dis disinformation campaign. And, you know, this happens. Again, we also, another way to do active measures is to silence people. So how can you do that? Basically, you block their views. If somebody is saying something wrong about you, you just block their views. So basically, if you can't read Romanian, it says like um, a Facebook account for this famous guy in Romania, I don't know if he's famous anymore, was blocked. And, you know, it's pretty simple. If somebody's saying bad, something bad about you, you just block him, you silence him, and then he's gone. No? And then, this is pretty interesting. Let's, let's, let's play a game. You know, if I were to come to you on, on street and say like, I'll give you some money, uh, would you go with your Facebook account and uh, report a page? Whatever page I'm telling you, would you do it? So raise your hand if you do it, if you report a Facebook page for one euro. Okay. Two euros? Four? I go to you and say, like, I give you four euros. Just report. It, it, it doesn't affect you at all. It takes 20 seconds. Ten euros? Would you report it for ten euros? Nobody? Really? Twenty euros? Well, you have a winner. Nice, nice. Thank you, thank you. That's a round of applause. Let's get a round of applause for the win. So 20 euros. Yeah, you go to the people and then you actually get like, you know, report this page, report this page, report this page. And then if you want to have like 100 people or 1,000 people, the costs are $20,000. You know, it's, it's nothing compared to the active measures cost of $9 billion. So that's it. Internet balkanization, please. Uh, go, uh, my, my friend, my dear friend, uh, Stefan Tanasse, he's presenting about internet balkanization today. Don't miss his talk. Basically, the idea is, instead of having like a global network uh, where proper checks can be implemented, you, you create your own internet local, um, local networks. For, for example, in Iran, they blocked, uh, they blocked Telegram and they created a new application called Sorosh. In Russia, instead of Facebook, you have uh, Vkontakte. You have Google, you have uh, Yandex. In China, you have other search engines, and so on, so on. So this relates to the fact that if we don't uh, consider these facts, and if we're not taking these facts into consideration, more and more countries will turn black. And this is the Reporters Without Borders, the Freedom Press Index for 2018, and I'm afraid that more and more countries will turn, turn black. And then lastly, the last thing is about privacy. And then there's like, there are some definitions of privacy, but from my point of view, privacy is the state of being free from unwanted or undue intrusion. The freedom to be left alone. And this is very important. 
you might have the illusion of privacy. You might say, oh, my life is private, but then you're being, uh, you're being um, monitored, uh, all your communications is being monitored. So that's something that you have to protect against. But then there are other people who say nothing to hide argument. Basically, they say, my life is not important. OK, I'm, I don't have anything to hide. I'm, I'm giving out everything on a clear plate. Here, here, take it. Then this is a very, very dangerous slope. And then you should actually be careful about this. Because if you're willing to hand out your data on a, like, a free platter, then we have like companies like Cambridge Analytica who are saying, sure. I, I'll take this data, I'll take as much data as I want. And then what do they do with it? They process the data and they try to target you with specific information in order to manipulate you. So don't give out your data, try to be as restrictive as possible. Else, these two events that I never thought would happen, happened. And Cambridge Analytica is kind of dead, or they changed the name, but there are other companies. So advanced symbolics, I've never heard about this one before my research, and basically they say, they, they disrupt the industry and set new standards in behavioral research. Yeah, sure, behavioral research. I know what this means. You know, it's like basically Cambridge Analytica. So check out this guy, th this AI. They correctly predicted the uh, vote in America uh, yesterday. So they, they know their stuff. So is privacy dead? Is there anything we can do? I think there is. There is hope. So I think the first thing that we need to do, user education. The second thing we need to do, quality journalism. So um, media outlets, they have to have fact checks and they have to provide quality journalism. Secondly, user education, because it all starts from the users. There was a report that said that fake news was most spread by people and not by bots. So people spread the most fake news and not bots. And, you know, there are other ways. Lithuanians also create an artificial intelligence. But in Romania, it's not like we can actually start creating this stuff. So basically what you can do, you can donate to people who do uh, actually good quality journalism. So if you, don't, if you want to do it something good, if you want to um, combat fake news, if you want to uh, fight it, donate to these guys. These are like um, some really quality guys that are doing uh, amazing stuff. And in the end, the information war is here. And the problem is that there was this uh, Ask Me Anything Reddit, and then some with this uh, the Romanian search team. And one guy asked, what are you going to do if Russia or somebody else will start a campaign for, to influence our elections? And they said, it's not within our capabilities. And then my question is, whose capability, within whose capability is this one? Is it the government? Is it public institutions? Who should protect against the threat of fake news? And maybe private companies like Kaspersky? I don't know. This is a question that I, I should answer. My, my job is here to like, um, give you more info and maybe you can decide for yourself. But up until then, I'd like to, take all the pe to thank all the people who helped me with this research. Ah, and by the way, the quote at the beginning was actually fake news because the guy who said the information, um, this quote, is actually Nathan Rothschild. So take everything with a grain of salt and try to um, combat fake news. Sorry for being late. Thank you. No worries. That was so intense. Thank you so much, Dan. Sure.